exactly did the classics influence the Founding Fathers? The surprising difference in what ancient history they focused on compared to what we learn today, and the lasting impact the ancient world has had in government. Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm speaking with Tom Ricks, an American journalist and author who specializes in the military and national security issues. He is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting as part of the teams from The Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post. His most recent book is called First Principles, What America's Founders Learned from the Greeks and Romans and How That Shaped Our Country. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you'd like to become a society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. So I, I just want to say thank you for joining me. And um, it sounds like you're writing a really interesting book um, called The First Principles, What America's Founders Learned from the Greeks and Romans and How That Shaped Our Country, uh, which of course is something here at Classical Wisdom, we love to talk about the impact and influence of the classics. So Perhaps we can just start off at the very beginning. Uh, what was sort of unique or special about the Founding Fathers' education? The education that existed for American elites in the late 18th century is entirely unlike what Americans learn in high school or college or university nowadays. The, the view of the world, their vocabulary, the way they understood things is just so different from today. Uh, the fun for me in writing this book was just seeing how different this country was. There's an old saying, the past is a different country. Um, the past, even though they had our same language and walked the same earth that we walk now in America, is so radically different that it just intrigued me, first of all, to try to explain this, partly because Americans see things like the Senate, the U.S. Senate, the U.S. Capitol building. They can take out a dollar bill and it has Latin all over it. They live in towns that have classical names. They are governed by a constitution deeply influenced by the ancient uh, Greek city-states and how they were governed. Yet Americans don't recognize any of that. So the first thing I tried to do with the book was just say, we come from a world that we hardly even see anymore. And this is the world that I'm, that I'm trying to show in this book. It's, it's interesting because we have hints of it all over. And sometimes it's something as subtle as the architecture of famous buildings in America. And you can see the classical reference. And as you said, in, in, in monies and things like that. But um, I guess I'm wondering for the founding fathers, they were they weren't different from what was just considered the norm back then. I think for anybody to get into Harvard, you had to learn Latin and Greek, right? Or oh, absolutely. And, and the curriculum basically was Latin and Greek. Uh, you really, there were only nine colleges in America at the time of the revolution. And when the founders were, were young, when they were going to college, there were even fewer. What they did for the first couple of years at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, William and Mary, and, um, which were the colleges that existed. What they did was study Latin literature. And then if they stuck it out and they were particularly intelligent, in their last year or two, they might read some of the Greeks. This is one thing I mean about the world being different back then. Even their classical world was different from the classical world we have now. And the more I studied this, the more it fascinated me. Uh, no, hardly any of them read Greek drama. And I didn't know until I was studying this that Greek drama really did not enjoy its revival and its standing as great world literature until the 19th century, when German academics lead the way, partly coming out of Romanticism, and they elevate the Greeks. 
uh, to the American founding fathers, um, the Greeks were kind of silly, noisy people in the background. They liked Sparta and they liked the Spartans. Um, they really did not have a lot, a lot of time for Athens. Athens was uh, anarchic, noisy, troublesome. What the, uh, they found, what they studied and what their education was founded on was Roman literature. Uh, the foremost ancient dramatist in their view was Terence. Nobody reads Terence anymore. Nobody, uh, nobody, Roman, it's amazing. Roman comic, Roman comic playwright. Um, and to them, those were the people to read, especially the literature around the Roman Republic. To them, the rise and fall of the Roman Republic was the central political narrative of the world. And you wanted to imitate the people who protected the Roman Republic, like Cicero, Cato, and you wanted to hold out as repugnant the people who undermined the Roman Republic, most notably Julius Caesar, who was seen as really the primary villain in the central political narrative. And so that is what they were taught, that Cicero was really the central figure in the central story. Cicero appears in their writings six times as often as references to Aristotle. And it's interesting to me, again, because nowadays Cicero is kind of seen as a pompous ass. Uh, back then, they saw him not only as a great political figure, but as a great writer. Cicero was the person to imitate. Now, there's one exception to all this, and this also fascinated me, Thomas Jefferson. Of the founders that I write about in this book, Washington, Adams, Jefferson and Madison. Jefferson is an exception. He prefers Greek literature to Roman literature. He doesn't like Cicero as a writer. And he's much more influenced in philosophy. Uh, the others are all kind of more or less Stoics, even if they don't know it. <laughs> uh, Jefferson is an Epicurean. And once you turn that key, it opens up Jefferson's writings. If you go through the Declaration of Independence, it is a garden of Epicurean references. Now, because he was trying to write for the common person, he did not quote Epicurus. Also, there's a lot of Epicurus to quote, but it is very much in its emphasis on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, an Epicurean document. There's a theory uh, that's not uh, original with me that Jefferson was in some ways the first American romantic that he anticipated the romanticism of the 19th century, more Greek than Roman, um, more supportive of the heart than of reason, believing that if passion led you somewhere, you didn't have to have a reason, uh, which is the opposite of say George Washington, who spent his life trying to control his turbulent passions and to present himself to the world as a man like Cato, prudent, even slow in his judgment, careful, um, with, and not wearing his heart on his sleeve at all, not a man of passion, a man of reason. Now, I, I think we once had an article about um, George Washington being very influenced by the um, general Cincinnatus, that, uh, that he sort of mm, carefully constructed, in a way, his image based on this historical figure. That's, that's absolutely right. There are two great Roman influences on Washington as a general. The first, as you say, is Cincinnatus, the Roman general who heard of a threat to Rome while he was at his plow. Um, and according to the myth, left his plow, went and put down this rebellion by a local city-state in 16 days, and then returned to his plow. And uh, Washington quite consciously modeled himself on Cincinnati, in part because they had the example of the English Civil War before them, just 100 years earlier, 120 years earlier. And Washington wanted to make it clear he was not going to be a Caesar and take over civil power or a Cromwell. Cromwell was this recent example to them of what happens when you throw off a monarchy and try to establish a republic. And instead, as you, we know, Cromwell basically establishes a new monarchy. Uh, 
The second great general, Roman general, who is an example to Washington is something that he had to learn. It did not come naturally, and that was to imitate Fabius, the Roman general who, over years of fighting, defeats Hannibal during Hannibal's invasion of Italy. What's interesting about Washington to me is he was a very reluctant Fabian. It did not come natural to him to fall back, to not be aggressive, to operate in a kind of series of maneuvers that exhausted the enemy. But in retrospect, it makes perfect sense because the American situation against the British Empire was very similar to the Roman situation against the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians and British had to come from overseas. They had a long supply line, and they had to bring in new people from overseas or from outside of Italy. And so they were easier to wear out. What you needed to do was figure out tactics that would wear them out. So Fabius, for example, stays in the hills where the cavalry is not very useful. He doesn't want to fight on the plains. He refuses to give battle because all that'll do is lose people and won't do much good for the cause. Washington is kind of um, slowly comes to this. In his first year in the American Revolution, 1775, 1776, uh, he wants to be aggressive. He wants to do amphibious, complex amphibious attacks against the British, which is foolish because he didn't have the seasoned troops or commanders to carry out such a, such a thing. Then he thinks, I'm going to fight a war of post. I'm going to sit in forts and make the enemy fight come to me. Well, what happens in New York City is that the enemy, the British, come to the Americans, and the Americans all surrender. Well, that didn't work either. So Washington retreats into New Jersey from New York, gets chased across New Jersey by the British, uh, looks like he's losing, begins actually thinking at one point, if we surrender, um, can I move it out to the Ohio Territory beyond the reach of the British and live out there? Uh, then come the two battles of Princeton and um, around Christmas time in 1776, and he gives a little breathing space. But over the next year, he moved to, to what they call a Fabian strategy, um, helped in this by a young aide named Alexander Hamilton. Washington was not a well-educated man, the only one of these four first presidents uh, who didn't have Latin or Greek or French or German. Um, unlike Adams and uh, Jefferson, he never traveled to Europe. Uh, and he, he knew he was not a good writer. But he hired people who were very good writers, foremost Alexander Hamilton, then at around age 21, who lays out for Washington subordinate commanders, this is how you're going to fight. In a desultory, teasing way, he says, poke at the enemy, make him chase you, use your militias to hang on his sides, deny them forage for their animals. When they go out trying to bring in cows, ambush them. And this is the war that develops over the next several years. Washington really never wins a big battle until 1781 or 1783. And, uh, 1781 at Yorktown, the war ends in 83. But he basically wins the war by losing a series of battles and imposing more cost on the British than they're willing to take, especially after the French enter the American Revolution. So Washington's both a Cincinnatian and a Fabian, uh, but to his great credit, the lasting credit, his influence in the American political system is as a Fabian and a Cincinnatian who insist that civilian power must be in charge. At the end of the war, he submits his resignation to the US Congress, and very consciously, he bows to the Congress, they do not stand, because civilian power is in control. And that's probably Washington's greatest legacy to America. He voluntarily turns over power, does not become a king, and goes back to his farm. It's such a powerful image. It really is. Um, you, you can see how it's so effective and it was really brilliant of him to, to use that imagery. Um, so we mentioned Jefferson. You've mentioned Washington. Um, maybe you can talk about some of the other founding fathers and their specific uh, love of the classical world. Sure. The other two of the first four presidents, uh, John Adams succeeds Washington as president. He's an awful president, a terrible failure. Um, 
he's had an inflated reputation in recent years because David McCullough wrote a very nice biography, really, of Adams and his wife, Abigail, who was even smarter than Adams. Um, and that resulted in a, a movie about them or a TV series about them. But Adams uh, really has trouble. Adams, and classicism is interesting. Early in his life, he decides, I want to be the American Cicero. And this is a relatively poor kid uh, from outside Boston. Uh, he has to work for a living as soon as he graduates from Harvard. And he becomes a school teacher. He hates it. And he decides to become a lawyer. And he studies Cicero incessantly. He memorizes Cicero. And lo and behold, he becomes the American Cicero. He's very influential. He's the first of these four guys to start talking about revolution, to start talking about what are we going to do here about the British problem. Uh, but he never really rises above that Ciceronianism. And like Cicero, uh, he's very vain. Trollope, uh, who was a historian as well as a novelist, wrote about Cicero, that he talked beautifully about his country, Rome, and he did that quite a lot. He talked equally beautifully about himself, which he did even more. <laughs> and Adams is very much like that. Adams is just wears his heart on his sleeve, constantly complaining about how nobody's nice to him. And he says, and it's true, I realize there will be no monument to me. And that's true. There is no Adams on a dollar bill. If you look at Mount Rushmore, it's Washington and Jefferson. No Adams there. Um, but one other thing to, to Adams' credit, though, is when he loses the presidency in 1800, he turns over power peacefully to Thomas Jefferson, whom he bitterly op opposes. Now, he did leave town before... The, the inauguration, he got on the 4 a.m. stagecoach to Baltimore. Uh, but he did turn over power to Jefferson, and that first peaceful transfer of power to the opposition is a key thing in any democracy. So while I have a lot of problems with Adams, I admire him for doing that. The other uh, of the four that I write about in the book is James Madison. What's interesting is he's the, the, the last of them. He, he's 20 or five or year, so years younger in Washington. Uh, yet, of the four, he's probably the most steeped in classicism, uh, especially in an academic fashion. Uh, he, he reads the classic like everybody else does. Uh, he's educated at Princeton by president, the president of the college, Professor Weatherspoon, uh, Scottish, uh, the first uh, president of an American college to be brought from overseas to run an American college. Weatherspoon is steeped himself in the classics, in ancient political philosophy, and gives long lectures on checks and balances and things like this. Years later, when Madison is persuaded that the Articles of Confederation aren't working, and that's the system under which America was governed for about a decade after, at the end of the American Revolution, he uh, engages in an effort to convene a constitutional convention, and he spends several years studying ancient Greek political systems. How did the city-states work? How did the states ally with each other? What were the arrangements under which city-states uh, ha had this, uh, these leagues or alliances or unions? And he literally had trunk loads of text shipped to him from Paris by Jefferson. And he spent three years sitting upstairs in his parents' house, writing these out, studying them. He arrives in Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention, knowing this stuff better than anybody else. Essentially, he got done himself a PhD in ancient political philosophy. And so he becomes the dominant voice in drawing up the American Constitution, which, despite the best efforts of certain presidents lately, still exists and still is the law of the land. And then, not only does he help draft the Constitution, he leads the campaign for the ratification because each of the states had to approve it. A certain number, uh, you had to have nine of the 13 come together to vote for it. And he runs that campaign to do it. And then ultimately, years later, he becomes Secretary of State under Jefferson and then President. Now, Madison, I think, is neglected um, because of the glamour of the others. 
arguably did more to create the United States than I think anybody except Washington. So you mentioned before that they studied more Roman history than Greek history. And I guess that surprised me a little bit because obviously when people think about democracy, they think of Greece more than Rome. Um, and so then you just mentioned that Madison sort of studied more Greek history. So how much do you think the, the founding fathers were maybe unique in being inspired by the Greeks as well as the Romans? Or were they getting most of their inspiration still from Rome? They got most of their inspiration from Rome. Um, one big except, well, two exceptions, I'd say. First is Xenophon, um, who was read a lot, not just for uh, the, um, his military accounts, uh, the, ret the retreat from, from Persia or really Iraq, uh, but also uh, in the other is Polybius. Uh, they all read Polybius and sort of got, you know, one foot in either world, uh, a Greek who spent so much time in, uh, in Rome. And especially they all took to heart Polybius's view that good government balanced monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. And so in the American government, the monarchy has its echo in the presidency. The democracy has its echo in the legislative body and the um, aristocracy has its echo in the judiciary. And that they're supposed to all balance each other. What Madison does uh, though is take uh, that system and say, you know, virtue isn't enough. The, the, all these people believe in public virtue, public mindedness. And Madison and Hamilton come along a bit younger than these other guys and say, you know, all this virtue stuff's not working. And what we have to do is balance vice with vice, interest against interest. And Madison designs a ferocious system of checks and balances with the notion that don't have one in the legislature, have two. Have the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives check each other. Have the legislative branch check the presidency has the judiciary quite powerful, able to overturn laws and say those aren't correct. Uh, he really wanted to disperse power across the country. And I think that may be the untold story of America is how much power is distributed, not just in the federal government, but also to the state governments. And so the, any power that is not part of the federal government is, is part of the state government. The result of this is you have a, re, a recipe for gridlock. But in Madison's view, gridlock, political gridlock, is not a bug, it's a feature. If you people can't figure it out, if you people can't compromise, then everything grinds to a halt, because grinding to a halt is better than internal civil war. So Madison, I think, kind of anticipates where American politics is now. We have ground to a halt. It's kind of like a Hippocrates, you know, first do no harm. You know, if you can't do something, it's best to do nothing. <laughs> Exactly, and it, it's a kind of a cynical view, but it's, it's based in part on Madison's view of what happens in the American Revolution. The people who fight and win the war are not the people who profit from it. Um, just to go back a little bit to, um, you mentioned Xenophon a long time ago, uh, and I was gonna ask that, um, you know, West Point, they still read Xenophon. I mean, it's interesting that your average person in the street has no idea who Xenophon is, of course, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, if they are going to know a historian, maybe even they might know Thucydides, but Xenophon is not really given much love. Oh, um, I think they, people confuse Xenophon with xenophobia. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he was a Greek guy who didn't like people, foreigners. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it's interesting that, it, I guess, in the military world, he's still very relevant. And, um, well, he's uh, incredibly relevant. Look at the... Um, the American military over the last 20 years has fought in the exact same place Xenophon fought in. I mean, I think actually the, the key battle in which the, um, the Persian um, emperor defeats the, the rebels challenging him who have hired these Greek mercenaries to help them out uh, is just south of present day Baghdad. And so the retreat up country um, is right straight up the Tigris Euphrates, the Tigris River, uh, up into uh, today's Turkey, and then eventually to the Black Sea, which is, I used to say, we let uh, to American officers, let's do a Xenophon staff ride. But yeah, they, they study Xenophon. And actually, American, a lot of American military people 
um, do read classical history, much more, I think, than the American population. James Mattis, American general who later became Secretary of Defense, once told me in Iraq uh, that he had located his headquarters in a certain spot because Alexander the Great had. He said, I figured it was, if it was good enough for Alexander, it was good enough for me. Uh, well, I was going to say that I, I think I heard also that um, the, the, the founding fathers were also influenced by Xenophon's biography on Cyrus the Great, uh, which mm -hmm. was interesting too, because how much of that was factual about Cyrus the Great is mm -hmm. up to debate. But that, that him as a character. It's all was, fiction. Yeah. That it's sort of made up. It's sort of, it's a little bit like Montesquieu's Persian letters you know, in which he has per two supposed Persians examine French society. Uh, the other Xenophon, actually, that a lot of them read was Xenophon's account of Socrates. And it fascinated Jefferson that Plato's Socrates is so different from Xenophon's Socrates. So Plato's Socrates doesn't know anything about farming. Uh, Xenophon's Socrates is an expert on the subject. And it's, it's funny because actually Jefferson really came to hate Plato, to loathe him. Uh, and he becomes a big Xenophon supporter and he spends a lot of time in his older age writing letters to friends about how uh, Z Xenophon Socrates is the real Socrates. And don't pay attention to Plato at all. Now, do you think that just to bring it to today, would the education of the classics be as influential now as it was back then? Would it have the same impact? You mean if America were going through a revolution now, or yeah, or I guess, or, or like if it, if, it, if it like entered the school systems or something, would it have the positive impact, or would it go the other way around? I don't. Th I don't think it would. Um, I. I think it would. It, it it would be seen as it has been seen in America for the last um, two hundred years as screamingly ir irrelevant to the American enterprise. Uh, that's why, to me, the classical world is kind of like these bones of a dinosaur that Americans don't even know what they are. There's just all these bones lying around, and they don't realize they came from this big thing. Uh, what, I, I think there's two ways in which the classical world, classical literature especially, might influence Americans. One is um, through a kind of bounce through the Enlightenment. If you take the view, as I do, that a lot of the Enlightenment comes out of sort of the, the rediscovery, the new appreciation of the wisdom, knowledge, history, literature of the ancient world. And that becomes the Enlightenment thinkers because Montesquieu especially, he, he's so driven by the Romans. Um, and that influences how people think. So the first thing is I think you might see a little bit more appreciation there. The second thing is the classical values, the emphasis on public spiritedness, public mindedness, um, which I think America has lost. Uh, the notion that you really need to have systems that compromise and adjust, uh, that, you, that Madison takes away from his study of the ancient Greek Republic, the, the city-states. I think we could take some inspiration from that. Will we? I don't think so. Um, America has got such fundamental problems right now that um, it is so distant from how the thoughts that created it, what these guys were thinking when they invented the country. One thing that really strikes me, for example, all the founders would be horrified at the role that money plays in American politics. Um, campaign, the way we finance our political system, it's legal, but they would say it's immoral and it's corrupt. They would see this as a corruption that indicates that America is no longer a democracy, but is becoming an oligarchy. And I think that is correct, that uh, I think America is becoming an oligarchy, uh, that the dollar counts much more than the vote. And that basically the super wealthy, the one-tenth of one percent uh, holding economic power have jimmied the system. I'm not a big fan of Bernie Sanders, but Bernie Sanders had something that I think is quite true. He said it used to be that Congress regulated Wall Street. Now Wall Street regulates Congress. 
Well, this is a, a lot of food for thought and um, it's, it's really interesting and I think it's an important conversation that people should be having right now. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Classical Wisdom Society members can listen to the entire podcast with Tom Ricks at classicalwisdom.com. In the meantime, please make sure to look out for Tom's newly released book, First Principles, What America's Founders Learned from the Greeks and Romans and How That Shaped Our Country.